Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this very special discussion. My name is Joe Lightfoot, and I'm a writer focused on the topic of community building. But today, I'm in the role of moderator for a discussion between the philosophers Daniel Goetz. I'm here representing Hans and Friday. And David Long. Between, as well as any creative tensions that may exist between David's approach to integralism and Hansi's version of metamodernism. David Long is an integral philosopher, teacher, filmmaker, author, painter, producer, and MC. He's also the founder of the Integral Emergentist Revolutionary Movement. I've been deep into David's work these last few months, and his extensive back catalogue of brilliant and entertaining videos have been expanding my philosophical horizons. Welcome, David. Great to be here with you. Man, I'm very excited to be here. Thanks so much for setting this up and making it happen. And uh, thanks to you, Daniel, for showing up and holding up your side of it. I'm real excited to get into it. Fantastic. Also here with us is Daniel Goetz. He is a sociologist and friend and representative of Hansi Freinhardt, who is the author of The Listening Society, The Nordic Ideology, and the upcoming book, The Six Patterns of World History. I've personally found Hansi's work to be positively psychoactive, and I'm really excited to explore that with Daniel today. Welcome, Daniel. It's good to have you here with us. And thank you, Joe, very much for inviting me. I didn't know about this whole context around you and the community in Thailand and the community building work that you do. I didn't know about David Long's work, and I'm excited to be in the conversation. Excellent. So I wanted to start off by highlighting some of the things that you seem to have in common. Firstly, it appears you're both of a similar age and thus of the same generation, somewhere around late Gen X or early millennial. And what that means and what that's come across to me is that both of your philosophies and proposed political movements have a kind of fresh and prescient feeling to them. So that's similarity number one. There's another one that you both place a strong emphasis on the importance of developmental psychology. You both skillfully apply sincere irony in various forms of performance art as a means of effectively conveying your ideas. And your author both appear to be a reaction to or evolution of Ken Wilber's integralism. And I think this last similarity is a good place from which we can jump into the discussion. So Daniel, I'll start with you. I've heard you describe the integral movement as perhaps being not quite secular enough and also not focused enough on political change. Whereas David, that your critique seems to focus in on Wilbur's preference for Buddhist ontology. So I'd like to invite you both to expand on that a little bit. I'll actually start with you, David, and then move over to you, Daniel. So yeah, give us your thoughts on that, David, if you would. Yeah, the reason that I'm so critical of the Buddhist ontology is because it's good on an individual level, but when it comes to scaling and trying to have an integral society, then it becomes biased and unhealthy and like trying to collapse everything into his particular preference. And so it starts with my <laughs> critique of Wilbur because right now my main project is basically to start an alternative, emergentist, more revolutionary version of integral so that way we can get a healthy integral movement going. Ultimately, I'm interested in activism and changing things big picture, but right now it's starting with like cleaning up the house around integral and trying to find people who are on the same page around some of these important topics. And so I'm definitely interested in the activism big picture, like how can we fix the world? How can we use these ideas in a skillful way and make a difference with them as not just a criticism of Wilbur? Yeah. And I've also heard you, you pay a lot of respect to Wilbur, you've said that you've studied his work as closely as anyone over the last 10 years. You've absorbed most of his material. So it is kind of of the transcend and include approach, even with his work. But there is a pretty marked difference, particularly in your emergentist approach versus Wilbur's idealist approach. And I mean, that's one of the reasons that I'm excited to be in discussion with both of you, because I'm, I'm wanting to get clear just how aligned you are in that philosophical, ontological perspective, as well as the political movement part. So yeah, is there anything you wanted to add there, David, before we move over to Daniel's? Yeah, input? I mean, I'm, I, I certainly think that stuff is important. Like I came to Integral through Joseph Campbell. So I was really excited when I saw that Wilbur was also influenced by Joseph Campbell. And that's kind of where we get this pre trans fallacy distinction. Wilbur's making it in more of a developmental context, but he says that he's talking about the same distinction that Joseph Campbell was making. And so at first, when I was listening to Wilbur talk, I was actually giving him what I call the transrational benefit of the doubt. I was hearing him talk about Buddhist ideas and I'm like, okay, I like Buddhist poetry. I can get down with this, you know, but when it's always Buddhist poetry, I started to be like, okay, well, what is what does he really mean? Like, does he really mean that there was this I amness before the Big Bang? Does he like literally believe in spirit? And when I started to really dig in deeper to really try to figure out what he thinks, not just give him like the benefit of the doubt for the best version of his read, I started to see that he breaks his own rules in lots of ways to integrate his own bias. Mm. And I don't feel like he's really doing a very good job of being true to his own methodology. Like, I think that I agree with a lot of his general distinctions and his basic 
basic methodology. I've been interested in how we can expand it further. Is there ways it can be upgraded? And I've been working on doing that a little bit too. Like, I don't think it's good to just talk trash. I think if you're going to be critical, then you should also offer up solutions to those problems. And so I've been trying to do that as well. I definitely think that we can do integral better. And I'm not the only one. There was lots of criticism in the community before I got there. There was already a lot of criticism and a lot of work done by people. And so that really helped me to see Wilbur's work better too. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of integralists who agree with me, Daniel being one of them, I would say in large part. And there are lots of schism movements that have happened out of the integral movement where people have been really excited by Wilbur at first and then kind of outgrown him because they see the ways that he betrays his own theory. So while I'm very grateful to Wilbur, and I definitely give him credit because, I mean, I'm taking up the integral banner. Let's keep going with it. It's good to be true to his vision, but I think we can do it better. And so do a lot of other people. And so we're going to work on doing that. We're not like a trash talk movement. We're a let's get stuff Mm. done movement. So I I just add that both of you do a bit of trash talking and you do it so well, I might add. It's not your only thing, but in particularly in the listening society, I enjoyed some of Hansi's takedowns very much. And particularly because after that, that there was added an, a way forward. And you do the same thing, David. It's not just critiquing for critique's sake. It's it's a door opening to something new, a fresh conversation. So yeah, I really enjoyed that. So Daniel, have you got any thoughts on that idea? What was your relationship to Wilbur and integralism? Yeah, where, where you're at with that now? Oh, oh, I mean, obviously a very profound relationship. And if I had to name one writer, thinker, scholar that influenced me the most would be Ben Wilbur. And one for which I had, and, and in many ways still do have, the most admiration it would also be Wilbur. Now, he came across that stuff at a bit older age than many people do, and was 25 at the time, and read his books when they had already grown to a certain popularity. And I found the maps that I had been looking for. I was a sociologist. I noticed that, aha, you can go with Luhmann systems perspective, or you can go with critical realist perspective, or you can go with structural perspectives or Marxist perspectives, or you can go with social psychology perspectives and then interaction. And I felt "Mm, there should be some kind of map. So you don't just choose between these perspectives arbitrarily. And there should be some kind of meta theory to build the argument for why you should choose any one perspective any one time and through which you could evaluate the perspectives in each particular case. And I thought maybe this could be my life's work. I just kind of Hmm. saw the contours of that as a master's student. And then I'd also gone through a bunch of relatively severe inner crises, late adolescence or early adulthood, and on a pretty profound level, wasn't really happy. Something was off. And Mm. in my general phenomenology, I guess you could say something just feels weird, or you can get an alarming feeling something is wrong, and then you can't put your finger on what it is. And I think a lot of young people experience this, especially a lot during these years. I can call alienation, call existential crisis, you can call some kind of growth crisis, etc. But I think also a big part of it was that I had no training in inner work, and I had grown to a certain existential depth, and I had also some issues and traumas at certain difficulty or depth, that level of difficulty or depth that required heavier toolkits than I was equipped with. Mm -hmm. And in this context, then I discovered meditation, more serious meditation, going to longer retreat. I understood I could coordinate that with Freudian perspectives and so forth, and with sociological perspectives and political engagement, which I felt elegantly into place in the integral perspective. So very enthusiastic. I can bring up one of Wilbur's books now, many years later, and look at them, and I will recognize the sentences because they were really imprinted in my brain when I read them. My whole system, every cell was ready for this kind of perspective. So it was a very revolutionary process for me to get in touch with all of this. Trying to use these perspectives then, first I tried to use them in academia. I noticed they fucking work. Nobody in academia knows about them. You could go from seminar to seminar, from professor to professor, from area to area, and you could tell them things they didn't know, even though they were the experts. You could best all of your professors, almost. If they just gave you a chance, you could finish a sentence. So first I tried them there. Then I tried them as a map for political engagement. So I thought, okay, here's the integral perspective. I'm a sociologist, I'm a political thinker, I'm into philosophy, history, politics, the evolution of the state, and sociology, evolution of society, and more generally, the norms of everyday life and all of that. And I thought, okay, so we can use all of these perspectives to reshape society. And I started writing manifestos, I guess you could say, from an integral perspective, what would the future of society be? I was from Sweden, I still am. I figured, okay, what's what would be the future of a relatively progressive country such as Sweden? What would be a viable next step for this kind of society to take? And started then using these different perspectives, I gathered a bunch of people, Emil 
was one of them, or one of the other metamodernists today. And we got a reasonably strong movement start, maybe a few hundred members in total. And uh, we spread to different cities, spread to Copenhagen also. And we had people having meetings and, and these meetings being connected through online measures and so forth. And we had seminars. We influenced a political party in Denmark and so forth. But when Emil and myself worked with the political realm, with these maps, a bunch of pathologies became apparent after a while. Mm. So there were things that just didn't compute, things that didn't show up on the maps of Wilbur's thinking, which isn't so strange if you think about it. I mean, he read a bunch of books and he meditated a whole lot. And then he went to a lot of discussions with a lot of interesting people. These maps were not created in the political game or the political arena. So they never got that feedback from the world. Mm. And there was never this feedback process back and forth. So we started getting data, not hard data you could put in, in the sheet, but you know, soft data that you can discuss and have dialogue about over years. Mm -hmm. We noticed, hey, this doesn't work. So number one assumption we had was, okay, so you have modern people, orange people, you have green people, postmodern people, and then you have integral people, so yellow and turquoise and stuff. And according to these researchers, such as the spiral dynamics folks, you should be able to find something like 4% in a society like Sweden on the second tier, on, on the later stages. Hmm. And we thought, well, and these 4% are going to have more in common with one another. You're going to find them to the left and to the right and center and outside of the political realm in many different ways. But they, they're going to have more in common with each other on a meta level. I guess, like, uh, than they have with any of the particular first tier positions. So uh, we should be able to find these people if we send the right signals and organize them around the hybrids. Mm. We sent signals out, we did get response from people, but then the maps kind of broke down. I mean, people didn't understand each other. People seemed to fall in different categories and different lines of conflict that were recurring here. Some people seem more aligned with the spiritual inclinations of integralism, and others seem to be more aligned with the meta-theoretical and the complexity of this kind of thinking. And we also noticed that Actually, it was relatively rare that people would be representative of both of these sides. Hmm. We also noticed a lot of these people were relatively intelligent and successful in society. So, I mean, at first we thought, yes, the maps are correct. We are getting all of these integralists. But there was a prevalence of magical beliefs that didn't make sense. And we could also see that there was a kind of process in which the more woo-woo side, the more magical beliefs would take over over time. So hmm. the intelligent people and the people who had more content and were interested in doing more boring work would kind of be sifted out until mm. until you only had one big pot of magic. Did they go down with a fight or were they did they quietly escape from the crystal circle? <laughs> Rather the latter, actually. Okay. <laughs> they all came over to my group. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then looking, looking then at the integral movement at large, which brings us to a basic critique of where this leads, there's something obviously wrong with where we've gone together. If we would gather a big integral crowd, a big crowd of integralists, you're going to find professors, social entrepreneurs, all kinds of impressive people. And let's say you have a room full of 200, and then you do an arm race, and you say, okay, everybody here, of all the people here who believes that there is divine force, which knows its own direction, and it's discovering itself and guides us, and is pointing us together in a certain direction, in the evolutionary direction of spirit. And mm. most people would raise their hands. And to me, that's a breach with the Darwinian code. I mean, you kind of resigned yourself to a higher force. Which a lot of these people are taking those kinds of things metaphorically, though, and there's like a little bit of confusion in it, but they're like, could I see it as the universe moving through me? Yes. Like, I don't know. Yeah, like, I, I mean, can see there being... You're not wrong, David. And and I know you're being, playing a bit of a devil's advocate here, but you would also agree with me that this is just the first step. There's a slide here. Uh, and mm. the slide goes straight to hell. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I it, do agree with that. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, that one first sounds innocent enough. I would say, I can, I can buy that. Like, I'm also on a metaphoric level. Then, then let's go with the next question. You say, okay, so let's say this energy can be tapped into and be sensed when we are at our highest states and we are at the most genuine. Like, okay, yeah, kind of, I guess. And then what would be a consequence of that? So let's say family therapy groups. So you do constellation work. You, you guys know about this, right? That yep. you uh, bring together a bunch of people and role play a family model. Right. So in my mind, there can be something profound and intimate, subtle going on on the level of depth psychology there. Because, I mean, of course, your family patterns can be in people. But if you look at the presumption made by very many of the integralists in this context, they will literally believe that you affect the energy patterns hmm. of that family. And, and then why? Because Rupert Sheldrake something about... Uh, about Morphogenetic fields. Morphogenetic fields, which is basically yeah. a theory about telepathic dogs. 
dogs. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and I mean, before long, things have gotten completely ridiculous. And it's not just there. Then, then you do a hand raise. How many here believe in UFOs? That's big right now. That's having a that's renaissance, growing, isn't it? Right? UFOs isn't magic. So in theory, you could, you know, you could believe in them. It's just that if you have to deal with every hypothesis of such low probability of being true, then you could never get out of bed. You can do anything because then you have to discuss everything. Mm. So instead of discussing the solutions to the pressing problems, people within this highly developed, intelligent, highly competent community, they will mm. believe in magic. They will believe it, that the most relevant discussion to be had is talking about whether or not the aliens are here and what to do about it, which is, to me, a complete waste of time. Mm. And here comes the really scary part. Once you slide into those, like, what ifs, what if you start actually, literally believing that this life force is there? Well, and how do you know where, where that life force is coming from? Uh, what it wants? Well, somebody is going to be more connected to it than others. Well, how do you notice those? Well, with, Cults begin to form yeah, exactly. around those so dynamics. Have, I mean, I had mm. friends. And, and we're talking good, intelligent friends. And I will kind of keep my distance to these people, go to one or two of their meditations, because they would have like a little bit too starey eyes. And they, there would be this like, join us, join us underneath <laughs> all the time. And it's all based on what David would call a Buddhist ontology. It's not really just Buddhist, it's Vedic, I guess. Yeah. It's all yeah. based on the fact that they believe that there's this life force which goes back. And, and this is not a pre trans fallacy thing. It's just pre I mean, there's just a warp tunnel here when you're trying to go in the transrational direction. And you can also notice it in, in Wilbur's writings. He's super smart, super smart, super smart. And then he gets to when he talks about materialism and the modern worldview. And then he goes into a rant and he says, yeah. it's so bad, it's yep. blah, 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 mm. blah, 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 blah. So God is there. So what I landed in after all of these experiences was, mm. first of all, a bit of trauma, lick my wounds, like, hey, I've been part of some crazy fish. And uh, hey, sorry, <laughs> sorry, mom, you were right. <laughs> And, and the second part is, okay, so what do we do instead? Because I do see this stuff as freaking genius, you know? Yeah. And so that's kind of the paradox to get around. Hmm. So, okay, then we found metamodernism, which is another take on what comes after postmodernism uh, rather than integralism. And metamodernism is actually not a stage theory or anything. It's just one of these many theories about which currents are there in the culture at large. And culture art, and art, yeah. And arts and, and architecture and popular media and stuff. Yeah. So me and Emil, we talked about this and we said, okay, let's call it metamodernism and let's secular rise and let's politicize integralism. Let's update the models. Let's throw out the ghosts because there are ghosts here and they will harm people and they are harming mm. people and they are making this movement completely impotent. And yeah. uh, let us politicize it because when integralists get together, five years later, you still have integralists getting together talking about being integralists and they <laughs> never do anything. They never do anything. If we want to change the world and these perspectives can change the world, if we want to change the world, we have to put it in the perspectives. We have to put the politics there so that when you do this stuff, you do change in the world and then you get the feedback from the world and you don't go crazy and you don't kill yourself because people have also killed themselves when they go crazy over these things. It's a pattern I've noticed among friends. So these are serious issues. We have to seriously clean the dish up and mm. then we have to take the gold and use it and connect it to the real world, to the real systems and that's the political metamodernism we're working on. And I see, David, you're, you're doing excellent work on your end towards the same goal. That was a powerful finish. David, you want to chime in for a minute there? I just, yeah, I just wanted to say real quick, I, th I think that we're, we're pretty much on the same page about all this stuff. Mm. I would say the, the only slight difference is that instead of trying to secularize, one of the major distinctions that I'm trying to make is to push for an emergentist view, but also a healthy understanding of the pre-trans fallacy. Coming from the Joseph Campbell stuff, I know for me that a lot of that stuff was really powerful. The psychological read of mythology and like this understanding that, you know, all of our ways of talking about about things are just different types of poetry. And yeah. so I think a future part of creating a healthy integral society is going to have to include a healthy version of religion that's not superstitious and that's not divisive and includes all versions of the world's poetry as our common heritage. Mm. And that all of these stories should be on the same level as mythology. So it's like we should be able to talk about Neo and the Matrix in yeah. the same conversation as Jesus and Buddha. And so I don't think of this as necessarily a total secularization, at least not where I'm coming from. Mm. But I definitely think that there needs to be, uh, I agree with you in the rest of the stuff though, I think there definitely needs to be an emphasis on activism. For me, I think an important part of it is going to be about trying to turn the revolution into some kind of a lifestyle and to figure out ways to make this stuff practical for people. And, but yeah, I, I think generally we're on the same page. I also want to expel all the, the woo-woo bullish and I think it's really important that integralists are able to make this pre-trans distinction and to recognize it skillfully. So go ahead. Uh, so, so it depends on uh, whether or not Joe has uh, a greater plan for uh, for all of us. Um, well, but I think but he I does. Do, I do have a reply here. 
Go for it. Get in there. Go on. I'll, I'll jump in and guide us in a minute, but if, okay. if it's a, okay. yeah, so, share with so, us. So just, I mean, when I say secularization, I don't mean the, the expulsion of, of all enchantment and of all religious relating to the world, obviously. So I don't use the word in the, let's say, modernist orange sense. Rather, we are approaching a metamodern, co-created, post-ironic spirituality. For instance, we can have such things as co-created, explicitly imagined saints, or we can have exploratory, feedbacked, data-driven contemplative paths that are self-updated right. or we so can like have... one day saint hansi what's that one day saint hansi not just one day <laughs> <laughs> right now saint hansi saint fucking hansi is that hansi <laughs> that's that, the that, proper that, that answer as far as i'm higher presence <laughs> yeah. coming in but we no, heralded the same uh, so so that's that's one part of it i wanted to mention and the general pattern of all of the higher value memes or meta memes or the symbol stages if you specify just like the thought patterns you would go from modern to postmodern to metamodern or from pre-modern to modern, each of them are, per definition, a secularization of the former. So I'm talking about secularization in that sense. So first, you're walking around in a red, what I would call a Faustian society, and you believe in a bunch of Viking gods, and they have different powers. And then you realize, wait a minute, why don't we just have one highest principle? Some things should be more true than others. And ultimately, then there should be one highest truth. And then you have a more secularized version of that religion becomes some kind of what we think of traditionalist religion. And then it goes on, of course, modern society is, is a secularization of that and says, uh, okay, so if there's one higher truth, how come you only find it after 40 days in a cage and, or in a cave uh, when you haven't eaten, God calls you up, but nobody else can check for themselves. And it doesn't really make sense. So then you get the enlightenment paradigm and that's a secularization. And then you get the post, post-modern, post-enlightenment paradigm where you see that, aha, what if something distorts the view of everybody who checked the experiment? What if questions were precluded in the first place because power structures and language games and limitations and so forth. And that's a secularization. And then, of course, the metamodernist kills off the postmodern ghosts. All of these structures that you imagine are there and you essentialize. So, oh, it's patriarchy or it's this mm. and that. Metamodernism just says, oh, okay, it's a bunch of complex, chaotic phenomena with very many variables, which can be defined in many different ways and interacting in many different ways. And there's almost no purification left. And a lot of times what you saw as something evil was actually a developmental difference or a developmental imbalance of some kind. So it's secularizing in that sense. And then if you look at integralism, it has done that secularization, but then brought with it the ghost of yesteryear. And mm. I want to stress then how much pressure shows up in normal situations, in normal everyday interactions. You stand there next to a person and that person has their whole life invested in and they bravely went against mainstream culture. And they said, I believe in family constellation work. And you have to tell them, I don't believe you. Yeah. You're chasing ghosts. You're wasting your life. You're mm. lying to yourself. Uh, you sold out. You sold out the truth because you wanted to believe in something magical. And that's a hurtful thing to say. And you don't want to be disrespectful. You know, we're not disrespectful like that when somebody says, I'm a Muslim, I believe Jesus Christ is my savior or whatever. So you're not? I'm going to jump in here, Daniel. There's so much juicy material in there. I've heard you refer to that as just continually chopping off the head of God. You're doing that again and again, shattering dogmas at each new level is, is one way of defining yeah. secularism in this context. So we've got a context for us here of these two movements you're both moving towards that have a shared origin. And now let's leave integralism in that context behind it and move into what you guys are offering because you're bringing a lot to the table and I want to spend the rest of the time delving into that. A very interesting place which I think we can dance to begin with are stage distinctions because from a metamodern perspective, you've made some really bold claims and brought some new models to the table, really well spelt out in the listening society. And they're pretty different from Wilbur's integralism. They differ from spiral dynamics and I want to go into it from the lens of death to turquoise and exploring particularly your differences in stage distinctions beyond postmodern. So... For you, it's metamodernism, Daniel. David, you've got integral and then a number of other stages which you still describe as useful and powerful. I want to start first with you, Daniel, to just describe why you think that turquoise should be slaughtered. And then I'm going to hand over to David to make the, the counter case. Kill it, man. Kill it. <laughs> so, so, I mean, obviously that's being provocative. Yeah. So let's begin at the basic level where we started. If we take turquoise and we take people identifying as turquoise and we take turquoise as it is described in, let's say, Cook Reuter and Lovinger and Spiral Dynamics, it has different names. Then you would find a whole lot of new age people there. 
Twitter. And it's just not very credible. And then looking at all of these Santa Turquoise people, look at what are they achieving in the world? And a few of them are prominent theorists on development. But most people who walk around expressing these values, etc., are just common folks doing common things and seem to be limited by all of the things I mentioned before, all of these magical beliefs. So mm. on, on a very basic level, you just zoom out and you take a look at it. It's just not very feasible or credible that this stuff shows up. So that's the simple case. If you want to go in the more complex case, as you know from the listening society, it's supposed to be an introduction to political theory, but it's swelled and it became a much larger book than was imagined. For this reason, it became a book on its own. If you look at one of the main features there is that there is a developmental model and it's not non-Wilberian, it's super Wilberian actually. Wilbur has four quadrants and he says you should study the four dimensions of whatever phenomenon you look at. And these dimensions should not be reducible to one another, but you should be able to uh, translate them to one another so you can see their interactions. And then he goes on to create a two-dimensional model of growth. So why not four dimensions there? So actually it is Wilbur's model, except it's split in four dimensions. Wilbur had one growth hierarchy first, and then he split it in two. He said, aha, there seems to be a difference between states and stages, uh, which is a good argument. And then basically we split it again. So we said, okay, but when you look at stages, are you talking about whether or not you were brought up in a medieval society or a okay. modern society, or are you talking about uh, the stage, whether or not you're a chimpanzee or a genius human, for instance? That's a very, very, very important distinction. On the depth part, are you talking about the state you are in right now? Oh, I am having a non-dual state, seeing supernovas explode in my heart. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Or are you talking about who this person is as a person? Like, does this person embody these depths? Does this person know about this stuff? Can they guide another person through those, say, depths or heights of existence? Those are two different things. It's uh, useful for me to understand how that four you got to is actually a division of stage and state into two. I didn't realize that. And I just want to hone in a bit on the point, though. It seems to be that you, you make a strong case that you need a corresponding cultural code to have a distinct stage distinction. Yes. Uh, yes. So the reason there is so much confusion around there being higher stages yet than metamodern is that for a stage to be fully manifested as a value mean in a person, you would need all of these different ingredients. So you would need somebody thinking with a certain level of complexity, you would need to have the symbolic codes from a society that corresponds to that level of complexity and that way of thinking. And you would need an inner depth of that person that corresponds to the meaning making of that code. And you would also need to make certain that the person sometimes at least taps into states that correspond to those depths, etc. And also more complex thoughts for philosophical thoughts or deep thoughts, for instance, require of us that we wrestle with very, very very, very difficult, low states, emotions, terror, etc. And or that we are in states where our mind is stretched and clear and vast and open enough yep. for us to have those thoughts. And it, for you, it's it's a numbers game as well comes into it. It just purely isn't a high enough percentage of people hitting all those four things. Before we get into the number game, then there are a couple of things to consider. Okay. One is that, aha, are these four different kinds related statistically? And Actually, probably there's a weak statistical correlation. I don't know yet because this stuff hasn't been properly researched. But uh -huh. just with looking around, they appear not to be related, appear maybe just a few percent of correlation or something. So the more complex people of the world do not also appear to be more existentially profound. And the more existentially yeah. profound people of the world do not appear to also automatically be more complex. Actually, it appears <laughs> more or less unrelated. It's it fascinating, isn't it? That, yes, that is fascinating and puts you in a bit of a more sober look on what the whole integral population might be. Yeah. Uh, it's more transpersonal than we imagine. We need a shard of me, a shard of you, and we mm. put that together in a beautiful dance, uh, rather mm. than me being this uber-mensch. Uber uh, yeah. So the reason that it's so difficult to imagine that there would be a turquoise meta meme or value meme as a whole is that if you then look at where we are at in culture at large, you can see, aha, you have many people who are much, much more complex than you need to be to be metamodern. For metamodern thinking and properly use it, you need to be metasystematic. And it's not so uncommon to be at higher stages of complexity, which are relatively well described, paradigmatic or cross-paradigmatic. So you have people who are more complex and you have people who have extremely high depth who are far, far beyond what you need to have to grasp the meaning of the metamodern code. And you have people who can be in high and low states, you know, vary across states, or maybe walk around mm -hmm. on clouds and be Eckhart Tolle or whatever. But if you look at the code system, though, if you look at all of integralist scholars, 
all of them, myself included, Wilbur included, all of the developmental theorists, what is their target? What are they pushing against to be able to create their own thing? They are all pushing against postmodern postmodernism theory mm -hmm. and postmodernism. Uh, okay, Daniel, I'm going to pause you there in the interest of moderation. We'll come back to you. Yes, yes. So broadly, you're pulling those stages down and you're putting in metamodernism as it's all a reaction to postmodernism. And those people that are claiming to be turquoise or higher, in fact, aren't producing the goods in those four different areas that you talk uh, about. Well, yes and no. They can be above in all of the different ones, but mm -hmm. to be able to push against the metamodern code, you must have a metamodern society manifested. And yep. that's nothing a single person can do. It's something that happens on a civilization. The collective. So, it takes so, time. I mean, so just, yep. just like you don't have any postmoderns in medieval society, even though you have plenty of people thinking at high complexity, etc. In that sense, you don't have any post-metamodernists today. Gotcha. Okay, I'm going to pause you there. We'll come back to it. Wilbur, of course, has extra stages on top again, which I think you'd both agree he imported from Aurobindo and really went inwards on that. But for now, in the purple corner, I want to hear from a man who's happy to embrace turquoise. He's down with those higher stage distinctions. David, lay it on us, my friend. So you just said that out of all the integral scholars that you know, that all of them are pushing against postmodernism. Well, I'm glad to tell you that I'm not really all that interested in postmodernists. I'm looking for integralists, and I'm also putting a firm challenge to the integral community in trying to create this integrally informed culture. So there is some of that work starting to happen. There are people at these stages. I think it's a useful distinction. It seems like the way that you were qualifying it, though, was that, like there were people, of course, who were post-conventional, like you said, in medieval times or whatever. But like what allows for them to be a postmodernist is to be part of a postmodern culture or something like that. So it's not just about thinking at that level. It's about a culture that's created by more than just one person. So right now, I think we do have this culture. It's just really small. And going back to this other idea, I asked Don Beck what he thought about Ken Wilber's integration of Orobindo state stages stacked on top as like all of these higher stages above third tier. And he says that he thinks that kind of stuff is green new age on steroids masquerading as integral. And I tend to agree. You talk about the people at these stages who believe in all these ghosts and all this stuff. And I don't think they're actually at these stages. I think what happens is that the cognitive line runs ahead. They have maybe parts of what might be considered to be elements of these higher stages, but they don't fully embody it. This is also, I think, a useful distinction. I think the way that it happens is that you might understand something first, and then you have experiences that allow you to realize it. And you're like, whoa, now I really get that thing, that idea that I had in my mind. And then it takes time to figure out how to live like it's true. So I think what happens is there's a lot of people who have these really high-minded insights, but they haven't fully worked on a lot of their lines and they still have issues that are holding them back. And they're still kind of learning to figure out how to really realize some of those things and then how to really like live like it's true. So these are some of the reasons why I think this is a problem and why maybe it's not showing up as turquoise. I do think that these distinctions are pretty useful. At least for me, they show up as useful because I know that there's a lot of people who are basically implicitly integral and they walk around the world and they're already making a lot of integral distinctions. They just don't have the terminology for it. But they're basically like isolated individuals who feel often very alone, very misunderstood. And I know that archetype well. I lived it for a long time myself. And I think when you find an integral community and you get these maps and you get integrally informed, I mean, yeah, you still have some stuff to work on. But when you can make those distinctions, that's really getting at this integrally informed thing. And I think it takes time to learn how to really live at those stages and to create this new culture together. So it is just starting to emerge. I mean, it makes sense to me to say if what makes this thing a legit stage is that the culture is born and it grows and it's actually doing things in the world. It makes sense to me to say that we're not really there yet, that we're still kind of trying to put it together, trying to give mm. birth to it. But I also think like from my own experiences that I think there might be something like a third tier, but I don't think it's going to ever, I, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't know if I would ever see it having a culture around it. Like, I guess what I mean by that is I think that there's this kind of thing of you not only have the understanding, you not only have realized it, you have been practicing it for years. And it's to the point where it's like muscle memory, like people who are experts at playing guitar, how they're just masters at it. They just shred it to the point where they don't even think about it anymore. Like I think that you could be an old, old man who has been around and heard every mm -hmm. single argument. I think that 10 years, 20 years from now, that we could be at this place to where we're just like, I'm here with you. I'm going to tell you what I think will help you. I'm going to engage with you as skillfully as I can, but I'm not super attached to the mm. outcome. I'm just doing what I can and maybe even I'll be surprised by what
what will come up. So basically like you're describing Jean-Claude Van Damme when you speak about this kind of third tier archetype. That's really what I'm talking about. You'll be able to jump up between things and do like splits <laughs> between the walls and it's, it's amazing. I want to I go into something with you, David, because you've been an integral teacher and coach for like coming on a decade, a long time. So you've been working specifically on the developmental side of people identifying as integral. And I think there's a synergy between the two points here because maybe you could split the metamodern stage into two as like early and later. And maybe that's just one way that you've got between yellow and turquoise. You're seeing that there's people that have emerged beyond postmodernism that haven't quite got what's late stage risen logic, they call it. And in your lived right. experience as a teacher, you've seen this dynamic between these two types of people. Because when I read the Listening Society, Hansi really got me. I'm like, yeah, all those points. I'm like, that's it. We just need the metamodern stage. But then I went back into Kru Grutter's work and looked at the late distinctions that they make between magician and ionist. And there was something in that. There was something that rang true with me. And so, yeah, David, speak a little bit more to those distinctions that you've seen, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, it's really useful, you know, like the, and this is why I say I don't think these people are really at turquoise is because it, it seems to me that at this early stage vision logic, there is this beginning realization of the relativity of everything. This is the postmodern stage. People are starting to realize, oh, this is all just ways of talking about things, right? And so it's, it's still very deconstructionist. And this is where you get all that pre-trans confusion. This is where the mushiness of it all happens. But like I said, some lines run ahead, some lines stagger behind. But in the next stage of vision logic, mid-stage vision logic, you start to get more of these distinctions coming online. And it's the beginning of the reconstruction. And then at late stage vision logic, you have all the distinctions online. You've been practicing them in the world. And now you're thinking about not just how can I do this for myself as an individual, but how can we create a new society with these new distinctions? Another thing I want to bring up that goes back to your point was that I do think that, at least the way that I've always taught it, I do think that kind of all four quadrants are represented in the spiral. I would also make a distinction, like I'd say that Christianity might be a thing that can be expressed all the way up and down the spiral or translated all the way up and down the spiral, but it's historically born at blue or something mm -hmm. like that, right? So I think we can make uh, more nuanced distinctions like that. And I think that when we do teach the spiral, at least when I teach it, I always teach it from an individual perspective and from a cultural perspective. And of course, you could flesh this out into the states and stages and also the cultures and the political systems. And coming back to turquoise, we're developing culture. Like, I think it's pretty cool in the groups that I'm starting. One of the themes that I'm seeing is around processing tensions and not seeing criticism as a negative thing and this willingness and openness to learn and to build together and to refine this kind of growing and learning in public and this healthy version of both challenge and support. So I think that we're developing culture around this stuff, but along with that is also these governance systems. There are integral governance systems. And this is my life project is like, if we can get these integral governance systems in place, like I don't think it's possible to get everyone to the integral stage of development. Mm -hmm. Everyone starts at stage one. I don't even know if we'll ever even get to a point where we could get a majority of people. And if we could, the only way that would be possible is if we actually had an integral decision-making process to allow for an integral society, which would hopefully optimize human development so we could get to the point where we could start to bring people up to their highest potentials. Then we would see maybe something like mm -hmm. the integral age and this new integrally informed culture. Maybe there would be more groups around some of that stuff. I'm going to get a bit more into that. I'll just pause you there for a second. What I want to do is just kind of synthesize a little bit. We could spend hours on this and we can come back and chat again. It's a fascinating area, but broadly, developmental psychology is at the heart and thrust of what you're both doing, what I'm doing as well. And there's different ways of coming at it. There's, there's many different models, but we can broadly translate metamodern to integral. There doesn't seem to be so much friction here that it's going to cause us to not be able to synthesize. So what I'd like to move on to is just to briefly touch on the four quadrants as well. I noticed that that wasn't in the listening society from, from what I recall. And I know that still plays a big part in what you teach and your political movement around it, David. So I'll start first with Daniel and just get his take on how the four quadrants factors into metamodernism and particularly its implementation politically, if it does or why not. So thank you for asking. First of all, David, the vision around a society that has let's say, integral governance structures. And using these integral governance structures optimizes, not maximizes, the growth potential of the population as a whole over generations. That is my vision as well. Respect. In, the, in the second book, there are some steps taken towards concretizing such a vision in Nordic ideology. In the last part of this discussion, we'll delve deeper into those parts. So yeah, we'll come back wonderful, to that. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. And uh, second, then Joe, actually, yes, uh, these things map beautifully onto one another. The former question and this one about the quadrants. So 
First of all, if we look at the quadrants, they're the most misunderstood and underrated part of Wilbur's thinking. And Wilbur misunderstands them himself. He's a meta theorist, and the quadrants are a kind of heuristic for delineating the dimensions of any phenomenon. With Hold the, on. the main thing lacking in Wilbur's conception of the four quadrants is zoom. So he took some steps in this direction in integral spirituality, where he put together different eight zones. You can walk your way up and down different forms of quadrants and etc. But what did you say? Did you say zoom? Zoom. So zooming is when you look at the quadrants, you always have to specify which level you're zooming at and from which phenomena you're starting. Ah, uh, you mean like quadrants within quadrants and quadrants stuff like this. Quadrants, exactly. Gotcha. So there's a fractal and there's zoom. And there are certain properties of this fractal which are not discussed in Wilbur, but which are apparent if you understand how fractals work for mm-hmm. one thing and just see the logic of it. For instance, when you zoom, on, let's say an individual person and you want to understand their behavior. Okay, mm-hmm. so is that inner or outer? Okay, so it's the outer quadrant, actually. It's the external quadrant. But we want to understand the inside of that person so that you can explain their behavior. So then you're zooming on the inside of the outside, but then you want to understand how this person was shaped by Mm -hmm. his or her context. And then you have to zoom on the lower left of the inside of the outside of a person's Mm -hmm. behavior, for instance. And then what happens is the whole thing twists. With every zoom you make, the whole model is going to twist two steps, actually. So things become very very counterintuitive once you can do the zoom thing. And this is a major difference then between people who are going to think at the systematic stage and people who are going to think at the metasystematic stage and people who are going to think at the paradigmatic stage. What I'm presenting now is the paradigmatic stage uh, understanding of the quadrants. And the paradigmatic stage, cognitive stage, intuitively thinks in terms of fractals. The metasystematic Mm -hmm. stage, the stage below, the one necessary for to understand that a modernist more fully, intuitively thinks in terms of topology I guess you could say, like how you can traverse a mathematical realm, the shapes of it. And systems, of course, think in complex functions with many different linear and nonlinear components. So looking then at the fractal zoom of the four quadrants, you can see that when Wilbur says the world tetra arises, he makes a mistake. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. It works its way through a kind of a tunnel. And the arising has actually nothing to do with this particular heuristic. It's just a very smart heuristic for teasing apart what we mean with different words so that we can properly describe them and not not mix up when we talk about different zoom levels, when we talk about different phenomena, we can relate phenomena to one another, etc. So if the four quadrants, it's not apparently very present in, in the Hansi books. Mm. It's in the background. Quick notes also, you can notice it. Yeah. But those aren't books about meta theory per se, and they're not sure. books about the zoom and about the quadrants. But if you look at what the vision entails, it entails creating a knowledge structure for a knowledge community so that it can create a political community to affect social and political structures and economic structures so that these may affect behaviors, so that behaviors through their institutionalization and repetition can affect inner growth of people. And the inner growth of people can affect their relationships, which can affect, well, systems again. Systems again. Yeah. So we've got a broad, quick overview. So basically, quadrants are in the background of what you're doing. You're using them inherently through the system. They may be explored more explicitly in other work that you do, but they're there. David, I want to hand over to you to get your take, because from what I've seen from a lot of your work is that it's more explicit that the quadrants play really into the, the way that you enact political change. So yeah, give us your take on that, please. Yeah. I like what you said. My epistemology video explores the quadrants within quadrants on the exterior mm-hmm. then like I have a spiritual practice video which explores quadrants within the upper left it's 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 a little bit hard I think for me to parse out in terms of epistemology whether it's just upper right or if it is both the exteriors and if the spiritual practice is only upper left and if it's not just the interiors so I'm a little bit unclear in my own thinking about that I guess but mm-hmm. I definitely see the value of this thinking about quadrants within quadrants when I first came across quadrants it was before Wilbur I had a version of quadrants that was called divisions of four it was a little bit different it was like twisted at the bottom and it was more like a cross than like grid style but the thing was that you could apply it to almost anything and get uh, dualities within dualities and like it was a helpful tool to be able to think about things and get different perspectives on a subject Mm. and I would apply it to lots of things almost anything I would try to apply it to and see what kind of insights it could give me it was a really helpful tool Hmm. but you know on the other side of this idea of the tetra arising I've also been working on the 
this idea of nested quadratic holarchies, hmm. where it's like there's different ones. The order is different depending on what the topic is. So if it's like ontology and cosmology, you have this emergent arising of interiors out of exteriors, like the interiors are nested in the exteriors. Whereas if you're doing epistemology, the interiors are primary and you have to do work to get to the outer exteriors. Then I think there's different things like priorities. Like I think that certain quadrants should be given more emphasis in terms of priorities than other ones. Like for example, I think the truth is really important because we need to know what's true in order to be good. And then beauty, anything can be beautified almost. I don't want to say that it's cheap because I know that aesthetic value is really important. But I think if you reverse the emphasis and say that beauty is the most important thing that you're going to mess up your morality. So a lot of people with the whole just tetra arising, they don't think about these different nuances. I think there's also another one for accuracy. I think that personal phenomenology it's the right tool for the job to be able to get out of particular type of knowledge, but it also might be the least reliable methodology that we have. And so understanding these different factors and splitting them apart is a really good tool on the other side of this tetra arising. Okay, I, I, that's a good I point, Beth. I think it's cool that we're coming up with these new systems on the back of deconstructing Wilbur and adding more complexity. So that's good stuff. Yeah, the, the system evolves, right? And I mean, I think what I'm hearing you both say is that there's a place for the good, the true and the beautiful, and you shouldn't reduce one to the other, which tends to happen in a lot of other discourse. And also, I think something you might be in agreement on, which is relatively new to me to think about it this way, is that tetra arising doesn't really work the whole way up and down if you think that consciousness only really emerged once the human brain developed. I mean, unless you're coming from a pan-psychic view, it doesn't really match. So there's kind of a hole in that approach yeah. anyway. Only in sentient holons. Well, sentient holons. I would actually like to add something because sure. like, the whole thing elegantly fits with the, the former discussion then. Mm. So if, if you're stringent about four quadrants emerging, the four quadrants being dependent on one another, and if you want to name a phenomenon that emerges across all four quadrants, hmm. uh, then I think it's clear among, if you look at these four, depth, state, complexity, cognitive complexity, which is very well described in the model of hierarchical complexity, and cultural code, then it becomes apparent that the cultural code that would come after metamodernism would not be stage-related, for instance. It has to fundamentally kill the presuppositions of mm. theory and metamodernism. That's the definition of it. And it has to build fundamentally different structures of thought and being. And it mm. has to build upon such structures. So the fact that you can develop higher stages of complexity, deeper uh, depth, and higher states does not bring forward this code in and of itself. So uh, you're saying we haven't seen that yet. It's just not here. No, it's just not here. Yeah. Which brings us back, of course, to the things you said about, well, look at the cook Reuters later stages. It's not very high complexity, but the model itself, she crammed everything into one. Uh -huh. uh, and then high depth from a very high depth perspective, which is mm -hmm. what people respond to, and which is why mm -hmm. this model, if you look at it, has almost zero stringent scientists following it and a lot yeah. of new age people uh, sure. yeah. and high states yeah. uh, which you can describe so what you look at there is if you are stringent about the four quadrants and you can zoom in and out of them and you look at the proper relationships and you will also see when things are lacking and you will see that aha just because something is there in one quadrant doesn't mean you can say it's there in another one because mm -hmm. the different phenomena do emerge independently after all. I mean, that's how these things connect in my head, at least. May I suggest that I think there is a switch all the way up the spiral. There's this dialectic from individuals to collectives, right? So I uh -huh. think that moving from integral to an integrally informed stage that you do go from an individual to a collective. And I do think that there's a switch too from usually an integralist, or there's more of an emphasis on translation, trying to skillfully translate to people down the spiral. Whereas I think at the integrally informed stage, there's more of an emphasis on transformation. Mm. At least that's, that's I'm not sure. Daniel would agree on the shift between individual and collective, though. Is that part of the modern movement? It's a deeper and longer discussion. In, okay. in theory, I do, in a relatively vague sense. So. Okay, well, let's park that there, because there's something I really want to get into the rest of our time. And I want to shift the gears a little bit here and maybe shift away from the ironic towards the sincere, because I've actually got a lot riding on this conversation. The work of the two of you has really inspired me, and we're facing a number of very serious existential crises. But the ones that Hansi talks about are the ones that I tend to agree with that David seems to be on board with. It's the inequality, it's the environmental degradation, that's going on. There's a third one, which you mentioned as well, alienation. Daniel. Can you? Alienation. Yeah, actually, that's the one that's closest to my work. 
So yeah, we're seeing this go on and you're both visionaries that are putting forward movements and political ideas. I want to see how there can be a harmony between the two of you and how that looks going forward, whether there can be a synthesis there. It feels like there already is in terms of intellectual ideas, but I want to zero in a little bit on the practical political elements of it. David's got a book coming out later this year called The Long View. He shared some of the images from that from me and it looks great. It looks like it really lines up with the ideas of the Nordic ideology, which is just fantastic. Anyone that hasn't read the Nordic ideology should get their hands on it now. Hansi spells out six different forms of politics, and it's hard to imagine how we're going to surf the waves that we need to without these in place. So I'm really keen to see where those overlaps are and where you're both currently at in terms of where your focus is on developing the movement, what you think the critical points are, and and how there could be a synthesis there. So does either of you want to start with this? We can have a bit of a back and forward. We clearly agree about a lot of things, if not most everything. (laughs) It seems like we have some little nits to pick, but we mostly agree. The movement that I'm trying to start right now, it's the Integral Emergentist Revolutionary Movement, which is Mm -hmm. those distinctions emergentist, revolutionary movement. Those are my disagreements with Wilbur. That's me trying to clean up the integral house. And then eventually, once we birth this integral hub, we're going to come out with this integral handbook. And through the integral hub, we're going to re-kickstart the integral movement and connect people and get it going. And there's different stages of unfolding of that. That's basically what the long view is. It's an outline for us to be able to work on different parts of the project together. Because what generally happens is when people think about these kinds of revolutionary movements, they tend to fixate on the part of the movement that they're most interested in. So this allows for us to let those people have their areas of expertise and to bring a lot of good stuff to the table, but for us to be able to put all this stuff on the table together. I think ultimately, if we get integral governance in place, if we get this integral hub together, if we get this handbook, basically this integral emergentist revolutionary movement just dissolves into the integral movement. Once we have these governance systems and we're teaching this stuff and we're expanding and coming together and we can build a lot of this stuff, one of the main things that we're going to want to do is team up with metamodernism and all kinds of other movements that are doing good stuff and to try to give them our tools and to be like, here, take these governance things that work and let's team up on projects. And ultimately, we want to integrate in everybody, the whole spiral. So we got to figure out how to systematically do that, where we open our borders and transcend and include and reach out further and further. But we need to also make sure that the foundational structures are in place such that we don't get ahead of ourselves and we don't corrupt the movement before it gets going. It's going to be really important to develop a good culture around these things. So I'm down for slow growth. I don't think that it's going to like, oh, five years from now, the whole world world is integral. No, this is like a lifetime project. The world needs us now. So it's not like I'm saying, oh, we can just take our time. There's definitely a fire in my heart around this stuff. There's like this hurry up and get it going kind of a thing. And it's mm. it's stress. It weighs on me. I want to help. I want to see a better world. I want to see justice. I want to see people come together. I, I know we, we can do better. I think we already have the tools to do it. We just need to get them in place. So, you know, I'm not a utopian. I don't think that this stuff is going to solve our problems. I think problems are part of life. And the good thing about this integral governance and this way of looking at things is that it's all about processing tension skillfully and seeing that as fuel for evolution. So I think that in our lifetime, we're going to see this movement really kick ass and go forward. I'm a young dude. I'm kind of cool. I have a hat. (laughs) It's a great hat, man. A lot of people criticize me for wearing a hat. Like, oh, you're just some young kid. I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to reach these young kids. Like, we're trying to make this stuff cool and sexy and fun and not just boring old white dudes talking about stuff all the time. Mm. You know, I was telling my friend who's my student, he's learning about this stuff. I was telling him, you evolve into this new world space, you know, like every world space is almost like its own kind of like little room. And you, you kick open the door to a new room and there's already people there. They're already working on stuff. They're already doing things. And then you eventually see what's going on and you get comfortable and then figure out what the problems are. And eventually you beat that level. And you do this over and over again until you get to these top levels and you kick open the final door and there's just a handful of old white people in here. <laughs> (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? And they're boring. And the stuff that they make isn't cool. And no offense to my other integralists out there. I I got much love for you. But we got to make this stuff more sexy and cool and bring it down and make the shit more accessible. I hear you, David. I want to thank you also. I salute you. I've seen over the last few months how dedicated you are to what you're doing. You've really thrown everything you've got into it. And for making it fun, making it funky and cool. That's something you bring to the table. You're an artist. Your aesthetic sense, your musical sensibility is a top notch. And yeah, it really weaves a powerful story. I want to hand it over to you, Daniel, to really just to hone in on where the the metamorphosis and rubber is hitting the ground right now and where you're directing your energies other than ongoing writing projects you have. Thank you. First of all, on a bit of a zoomed out level, I obviously agree with what David is saying. So, aha, uh-huh, yes, slow, but don't lose a fucking second. Hmm. I mean, not utopian, but in a profound sense, existentially optimistic. That's what I hear you saying. And yes, change.
change the institutions. That's where the rubber hits the road. And everything else we do has to come down to that stuff because institutions and governance is where you affect very, very, very many actions over a long, long, long time. So the long view, yes, very good. Uh, I didn't think about that. Your name is David Long and you're <laughs> the long you view. What's going on there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have you considered uh, the long view, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and so, yes, uh, something along those lines. They do have a couple of differences, though. First of all, I don't think that the integralist movement and the people in it are the people we're waiting for, unfortunately. If we're talking about the people who are currently in it, then maybe I would agree with yeah, that. Okay, exactly. And I noticed you, David, for instance, also wrote on this Facebook group, Erpis Integral Salon. And if I look at the stuff in there, basically, this is a Facebook group, one out of many out there. And it's one where there's a bit of a Western themed, like a Western movie with a dick image and Ken Wilbur or something. It's, it's about, you know, humor and expressing yourself and saying politically incorrect things in an integral setting. Like, I've been very it, critical of this group, by the way. Yeah, yes, yes, I, I, I know. If I look at what I can see in there, what has happened then to the older crowd of integralists, things that would have been completely unimaginable that felt like on the other side of the planet 10 years ago, 15 years ago, in this setting, uh, are now cropping up there. And we're talking extreme sexism, rape fantasies about Marianne Williamson, the, the American uh, candidate, uh, can Democratic presidential candidate. candidate, yes. And we're talking references to Nazi theorists like uh, proprietarianism. It's one thing that one or two people would mention stuff like that. But it's another thing that people support this and they believe that uh, these are allies or at least not react. They feel that this is uh, fresh or acceptable or edgy. I feel like the integral movement, because it was built on quicksand, was a beautiful castle and still a glass crystal castle built on quicksand. So now that mm. it's sinking, we're seeing some ugly ish come up. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. if, you, if you dig really far down in the psyche, and, and I mean, this disappointment that people thought they were part of a movement that was going to change the world and that you have reached an ubermensch, etc., and you see it especially in men 40 plus and yeah. plus. Uh, Daniel, like, you made that strategic decision at that moment after trying it out, getting political, to just start fresh. You, you know, yes. you brought new theory to so, the table. So but that's exactly. really the major distinction that I see yeah. between the two of you. Yes, You're yes. totally aligned. Yeah. So if you want to speak to that. Start fresh is important for a number of different things. For instance, if I want to affect politics in Sweden. So for instance, I was in Stockholm just the other week mm -hmm. and I gave two seminars and was relatively successful. And I was speaking to a political party formed particularly around metamodernist ideas and people have red Hansi and stuff. It felt relatively promising and people there were nice and the mood was good and people were being constructive and and visionary, but not crazy, and so forth. And process-oriented also. And yeah, yeah. So it's like the alternative with Sweden? Uh, well, yeah, uh, and unfortunately, the alternative hasn't turned out so well. It's kind of fallen back into, I guess you could say... Process-oriented political parties. Uh, well, or, or more mainstream Green Party. But that being said, I do feel there is something to build on. But if this thing would take off, let's say they get elected in Stockholm, if people in the press could go to their ideology and link it back to Wilbur and link it back to the things that are going on online right now in that community or to any of the magical beliefs, they would have a big nasty secret at the heart of what they're doing. The poison and, chalice at that point. Uh, exactly. Or if they could link it to any UFO believers or to the cult thing that happened or to Adidas abuses, it just goes on and on, the problems and here. One and, more to that is the uh, inherent hierarchy. After two decades of these people shuffling into different versions of hierarchy, you've got a lot of people, and this is why the generational aspect of this, we've got mm -hmm. a lot of people of our generation arriving. Mm -hmm. I don't really, really want to arrive into a 20 year established hierarchy of things that aren't quite clear to me. I I prefer this this idea of systems of networks, which I love the way that metamodernism is really resisting talking about power structures explicitly like that until they emerge. It's rather, we've got to create the network. So you know, I just add that. I agree, Joe. And about generations, I'm a bit of a pessimist here I'm okay. on a lot of issues. You mentioned before the talk, you said something, the darkness of Hansi. And actually, if you look at the dialectics of how the world works and what's the setting right now, what's happening out there in the internet public sphere, and the young generation. The ones who are 20 years my junior, so they are growing up just now, you see a pretty strong veering actually against political correctness, against the postmodernism of the millennials and the pathologies of postmodernism. And you see a strong support of not just populist leaders, but you people, uh, the young people, they want a more sober, but still nationalist. The uh, Jordan Peterson generation. Yes, yes. So, so you're talking about teenagers at this point. So they haven't yes, really yes, come about of age. the teenagers. So, so unfortunately, I don't think the millennials are the metamodernist mm. generation. And I don't think generations. Z, which is the tentative name of the generation one younger than us, I sure. think actually our children would be more on the realistic time scale of this. Because first of all, it's been so long since the Nazis and stuff. And now the world's soul kind of has got this fascination with this bad boy guy. Like, ooh, yeah. there's something there. I, uh, Strong man. 
Van. What's what's the name of um, Donald John Claude Van Damme? Uh, Donald Trump's uh, campaign guy with a uh, Cambridge Analytica. What yeah. Bannon? He's Bannon, a, Bannon, Bannon, Bannon. Yeah, exactly. He's a phenomenon Bannon. to himself. And he reads Julius Evola. Mm. The after, Four Turnings, right? Uh, what's that? He's into the Four Turnings. His historical framework yeah, is, yeah, is yeah, all so based I mean, on that. These are cyclical ideas about civilizations and so forth, and they're also metaphysical and transcendental. So it's it's transcendental fascism, basically. And this is a simple transcendental form. fascism. I haven't heard those two words. <laughs> the place. There's, they're also the meta Nazis. They keep writing me all the time. I, they want me to be friends with them. I don't want to be friends with them. No fascists, I've heard. But, so yeah. all of this stuff is cropping up with, with some accelerating pace and it speaks to the young people and it's less complex to be frank than genuine meta modernism or updated integralism. And it does exactly what David, you said, we have to set truth sometimes above beauty. And if you do it the other way around, then it can get pretty confused. Trouble. And, yeah. Yeah. and that's exactly what the fascists are doing. We're in this hyper-rationalized world. Uh, there is something transcendental that has been lost. Aesthetics should come first. And they are explicit about this. And that's exactly what Hitler did. He was an artist. He designed yeah. the swastika himself personally. And then it was imprinted upon everything. The first thing they did before they went after the Jews was they went after the postmodern arts or what's normally called normal lingua, the modernist arts, contemporary yeah. arts. So I'm doing a good job then by making sure this, like go in this more aesthetic route then is what you're saying okay, yes uh, yes and I, I mean you're on the road to transcendental fascism transcendental fascism it's important to connect to the cultural aspects of this uh, yeah of course or the battle is lost in that realm so for this reason I am working right now with something called the Met Modern Arts Festival which is held in yeah. Kiev and it starts in 12 days so I will be going down to Kiev in 9 days in the, the so there's still time to get a ticket I'll um, join you in Kiev you still get a ticket I think the full tickets are sold out but you can still get a festival only ticket on the for the cultural event. That's and maybe next year I'll be able to come and talk and perform at this thing. I hope. Yes, uh, definitely. I hope. It w- would be very nice if you do. We'll have a whole transcendental fascist stage for you there, David. <laughs> All right. We need one, to get the big strategy. banners and stuff. Can I comment about this Boys uh, and Chalice stuff? Before we do, I just want to wrap it up. There's like a bow on it. Yeah, struggle going. going on. And I think things are going to get darker before they get lighter. And I think what David is doing and what I'm doing and my friends are doing is, unfortunately, the attractor points don't point in our direction short term, but they do in 10 or 15 or 20 years, which is why we don't have a minute to lose because in that time period, whether or not the world will catch on to those new governance structures and new culture and new ways of seeing the world that will have matured and been purified from their childhood diseases, if that stuff isn't materialized enough, crystallized enough by that time, it, yeah. we just might continue off the cliff, right? But we're going to yeah. a chaotic time now. There are so many bad governments in the world, you can hardly count them. And based on what you're saying, Daniel, we better have some kids. I was going to dedicate my whole life to the metamodern integral revolution. But if it's going to be our generation, I, I guess I better look for some time to do that. David, you wanted to comment? Yes. I think we have a slightly different approach too. Like I'm not really interested in politics. Like I think that's more like translation stuff. I'm interested in trying to create a new system that makes the old system obsolete. And I don't need to have everyone become integral for that. I don't need to get everyone on board. I just need to get enough people to be able to get it going and birth it. And then I can sell it down the spiral to appeal to different people at their level. And I mean, of course, we need to work with both translation and transformation. Ultimately, I think it would be the best solution to kind of dissolve in the middle where you get like this pressure from the outside, like, oh, look at these dudes, they're over there and they're starting this new culture. And then there starts to be some kind of competition in the marketplace of ideas. Like ultimately, I think that this is capitalist society and the market decides. And so we need to win in the market. So that's more my solution is to create a new system that beats the old system in the marketplace of ideas and not by trying to sell everyone on integral, but by trying to sell everyone on how this new kind of society will benefit them based on their current values, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm skipping the politics thing. I know you're going to work on the politics thing and then we'll meet in the middle. You'll get to work on the governance side on that side. We'll get the governance side on this side and then mm. we'll dissolve into each other and we'll have the nonviolent solution, which I think is probably the best way to go. So David, I would simply object to that. You're not skipping the politics thing because what you're talking about is the politics thing. To be political is to deal with human beings who have wills and who have power claims and to synergize those things. That is the political. Uh, okay. And and well, maybe we're just using different definitions because when I say I'm not into the politics, I'm talking about like I'm not interested in trying to work within the current systems as they are. Yeah, naturally, we are going to agree on that. At the same time, sooner or later, you're going to have to touch upon human beings who are in this culture, in the system and so on. And that is the political. And I think there's a difference there. And I, I sense, to be frank to say, a naivety there that you think you can skip past the political because you've never really truly acted politically yet. You are thus far spreading this this message, but you're not yet acting on organizing people. And when you do, you notice 
you're there, you're in politics, whether you like it or not. So, I think there's some truth in that, Daniel. And, in, and from what I've seen with David, he's working with people in a smaller group of theoretical growth. If you look at his model of change, huh. it's about getting a core group together. And yeah. then he's going to hit that, that point that you're talking about yeah. very soon. And, and I think and, it's and Joe, another I think, discussion. Yeah, I think politics starts already there, actually. Okay. And Fair it's, enough. I mean, it's it's like uh, I want to make a cake, but I'm not going to use the flour. Like, sure. Okay, so there's no cake. Uh, well, and, and, based on and, your and, definition of politics, I would agree no, no, with you. No, guys, sure. it's the number one thing I hear from people who are going to fail. They say, "I don't like politics. I'm not interested in it." You're going to fail, man. You have to own up to the political. You have to understand that to change the world is a spiritual, epistemological, philosophical, and political struggle. You can't be without it. You have to own up to it. And that includes the boring stuff and the the power structures, etc. I think we might be talking past each other a little bit on this one, because I would agree with the way that you just phrased it. When I say I'm trying to avoid the political, I just mean that I'm not interested in trying to work within the current systems as they are. And in fact, I feel like I could say the opposite of what you just said, that like a lot of the people who are like, oh, yeah, you know, like, I'm going to get this good candidate. I'm like, you Mm -hmm. know what, like, I think it would be great if Yang figured out some universal Mm -hmm. basic income, and we can get some of that Mm -hmm kind of stuff going here. But at the end of the day, like that's just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And it's not really dealing with the fundamental core problems, which is the decision making process. Yeah. You know, if you don't yeah, have okay. a good decision making process, yeah. you don't have anything. Uh, so, so yes, if you if you phrase it like that, I do feel more reassured. And I mean, it's, it's just I've grown wary of this phrase, I don't like the political. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it is, guys, because this is where good faith and benefit of the doubt comes in. And that's what I hope we're building through these conversations. Because I can see where both of you are coming from having studied both of your work and you're both explicitly political. And it's just a measure of taking the time to unpack those different distinctions and see what's going on underneath it. And, and one synergy that I can see between both of you is you're both offering it as a competitive advantage. I love that about the way that meta-modern political theory is put forward is like, it's, it's going to win. Inevitably, you compete with any of the other systems and a listening society is going to produce the best outcomes, the best economics. And I know that's something Davis talked about as well. So yeah. I want to start to wind up soon. I'm going to have to resign myself to the fact that I think there's just different flavors of very similar, amazing vegan ice cream that you guys are creating. And when I have people in my community that are saying, all right, I'm ready to go. Because So what I'm doing with people is, is taking them in, hopefully some of these teens, showing them a good time, giving them some dance, letting them talk, getting them into the art, the music, so that they're feeling open. And then when they're ready, yeah, hey, here's a political breadcrumb that you can follow into some of these more heavy theorists up there. And I guess I'm just going to have to give them two books at once, and I'm okay with that. But I I hope we can keep the dialogue going on between these groups. And um, as it starts to bubble up, which I feel it will, there's more and more people coming to this that, yeah, there will literally be some more synergies between those groups, between the two of you. So before we start to close, there's one question. It's a little bit indulgent that I wanted to ask you, Daniel, in terms of naming the effective value memes the same as the code stages in your system. For me, felt perhaps a little bit confusing. And I wonder whether there was a reason for that or what the idea was behind using the same names for both. Mm -hmm. Good question. So uh, roughly speaking, when we look at the effective value memes, what are they intuitively closest to? They're intuitively closest to what is observable from the outside. So it's not so different from, for instance, when you talk about the spiral dynamics and then the spiral dynamics people will say, this guy is blue because he voted for uh, the Christian Conservative Party, for instance. and uh, believes in Jesus Christ as a savior in a 6,000-year-old world. And this society is blue, and then they talk about late medieval society, for instance. Mm. But obviously, there's a huge difference between the guy who just drove to his work as a chemist and the late medieval society. Nevertheless, because there is intuitive feeling of closeness of these things, it might make sense to use the same words. Also, just not to introduce too many new terms. The ones I use the most when I speak with other theorists, inner circle theorists, are actually not these. We use MHC stages. Okay. And the MHC stages, in turn, you can map them actually in an intricate manner onto Wilbur's quadrants, which is a, yeah. a strange but important piece of theory. Wilbur um, started referencing Commons theory. I wonder whether that was because of some of the ideas you put forward in his latest video on Rebel Wisdom. I'd never heard him say that before. He has referenced those in his earlier books, but okay. then he didn't stay long on them. And he also put Aurobindo stuff on top of it. Above. Yeah. yeah. yeah which One other thing, I want to poke a little bit. It sounds like you're pretty close to Commons and you've looked at the theories a lot. It was new to me reading it through your work. And when I researched it a bit, some of the critique out there says that when you get above what stage 12 systemic, mm-hmm. I forget the exact terms, mm-hmm. it gets a little shaky above that. Do you agree with that? Or do you think they're solid that up to 14 or 15 is pretty solid? So basically, originator of the theory, Michael Thomas and somebody named Richards, who, who also worked on this in the 80s, a couple of years ago, he came up with a suggested stage above cross paradigmatic, what would be a stage 16, I guess. But it was, in my mind, incorrectly formulated. And I let him know that it was still published in the paper, I think, for many 
different reasons he couldn't resist to try to formulate a higher stage yet. But up until that point, the stages are correctly formulated and they're relatively clearly formulated. You can understand and I can understand. I can intuitively walk myself through them. It took years to actually be able to walk myself through the cross paradigmatic stage. But I can understand, I can see and I can recognize them when I see them. But for empirical tests are only invented up to metasystematic, which okay. is 1.5 to 2% somewhere there along of an have adult, normal the adult population. Oh. Uh, have I done the test? Yes, I did once actually. And apparently I have difficulties with the simpler <laughs> stages, <laughs> which is a bit weird. And it's a recurring sure. pattern and there's not yet any real theory of how that works. So if you take a look up to metasystematic, you can test them. They're pretty, pretty solid. Uh, yeah, they're solid, but pretty bo boring. You have to do different logical little things and, and catch patterns. It's called laundry problems. Above metasystematic, you have paradigmatic and you have cross paradigmatic. So the mm. paradigmatic stage, actually, I discovered an intuitive way of checking it. Okay. And one thing is you can interview people and you can see how they reason around stuff. But the more important one is actually paradigmatic people because they are at the top one tenth of a percent or so in terms of complexity. They see a lot of low hanging fruit everywhere. Mm. So they see innovations. If the person is 30 years or older, you can just ask them, which innovations did you come up with? Because a paradigmatic person will have come up with a bunch of innovations. I got uh, a bunch of them. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just before we go to Poison Chalice, David, the reason I'm digging into that particularly now is because I'm at the point of introducing developmental theory into a community that's primed for metamodern integral thinking. And so if there isn't some kind of objective empirical test or research or validity behind one of the key lines, the complexity line, then you risk getting into cult status. And it's so mm. difficult difficult to come across as, yeah, yeah well, on top of this pyramid and, you know, well, how'd you figure this that is out? Why, this is why I'm wanting to go back and talk a little bit more about this poison chalice because of these, of these same ideas. One of my concerns is I don't want to just reinvent the wheel. And I'm not accusing anybody of that or anything. If anybody's doing that, Wilbur's kind of customizing that wheel to his own preference in a sort of unskillful way. And historically, it's interesting, like when you really think about philosophy, if you want to be critical of a philosopher, like pick one of them, because they all have some kind of thing that people will point to and be like, oh, look, Heidegger is a Nazi. Maybe we shouldn't talk about being a thrown object in the world anymore, you know, mm. Dasein. And I kind of see myself as sort of the, the neo Marx to Wilbur's Hegel. And, you know, maybe you kind of feel like this too, Daniel, uh, to wanting to turn the dialectic on its head and get it right side up. Like, I think Don Beck's version of spiral dynamics is dialectical materialism. He says that these things arise from natural life conditions, not from spirit or something like that. So I think Wilbur gets a lot of credit, but he's just a dude who gathered together a bunch of other people's work and organized. I respect the work that he's done, but he's the first word on this thing. And so I like this idea of Integral 2.0. There already are a lot of people in this community who do understand these distinctions. And I mean, of course, there's a bunch of cult members too, a bunch of people who believe in woo-woo stuff. And that's why I'm making these distinctions now. And I definitely agree with you about the problems at Erpies. In fact, I've been in there and tried to help them develop a healthy culture around that kind of stuff. And they basically didn't want to do that. They threw you out of dodge. I, well, I mean, I left because it was just unhealthy and unproductive and not really working. They weren't wanting mm -hmm. to do anything with me even though i tried a lot of different things you know but i tried the more kind of the poison chalice thing because you've nearly i'm you're being you're both convincing me either way each time it's great yeah i mean i guess in terms of the the herpes thing just to sum that up is that I, don't, I don't like the way that they're making this virtue of dickishness and when i talked to bruce the guy who, who started the group and who sort of loosely moderates it he said that there was a bunch of unhealthy stuff in the culture especially online mm -hmm. and what he's found through creating this group is that it actually has become like an attractor basin for all of the worst actors in the community and it's kind of worked to clean up some of the bad behavior ah. that was happening in other groups. So even he has admitted to me that he thinks it's unhealthy and problematic and like he's unsure even what to do about a lot of that kind of stuff. But I do think that the Integral Project is worth rescuing. I think that the Integral brand could be saved. I think that there's already a large international community around it. So it's easier for me to come in and, and work with maps that we already all agree on and be like, look, let's clean this up. Let's get organized. Like we all want this Integral movement. A lot of people who came to this stuff we're attracted to it, like you said, because there's all this propaganda around it about this integral movement that's going to change the world. So, I mean, I do believe that a lot of people in our community, even ones who are on the more woo-woo side, do have an integral vision for the future. And actually, it's through this integral vision of the future that a lot of my criticisms of Wilbur start to make more sense. Because at the individual level, people are kind of just like, you know, leave him alone. Let him have his thing. He likes that. What's the big deal? I like Buddhism. He likes Christianity. Well, like, who cares? But like, when you really think about scaling these things, that's when it starts to matter. And that's when you can be like, look, this is why it's important that we really get it right. Yeah. If we're going to yeah. be if we're going to be telling other people that this is the new way to do it, and we're going to be trying to systematize this stuff, we better be able to back it up and 
know what we're talking about. And that along with this idea of like, it's not just we should all worship Wilbur. It's that we need to create a peer review and help refine it together and to bring real upgrades to the table. I think a lot of people in the community are like, oh, dang, like this is actually happening now. Maybe this could actually be viable. And that automatically gives me a boost because that saves me the 30 years of work that Wilbur has already done to build a community. I can clean it up in like a few, like three to five years and then we could kick it yeah. off and move and I could have a big move. That's <laughs> David, something, something you mentioned that speaks to me really of maybe one of the strengths that I think the millennial push has is that we've grown up exposing cult leaders, political leaders so much that that worship of one individual, while it may still happen, it seems to happen in humans a lot, we've got more defense mechanisms against that. And another fascinating thing you frame there is Erpes is a kind of cleaning up of a shadow side of Integral. Integral's been around long enough to have its shadow sides come out. Daniel, I want to throw to you, metamodernism, the movement you've just created, have you spotted its particular shadows yet? Have they started to manifest in any way? And if so, what are they? And actually, I, I mean, the shadows are the same ones, actually. When I started working with integral politics a while ago, it's process-oriented and it's highly democratic. It's highly egalitarian. It includes all different voices. The underlying thing, though, is that you still believe there's a directionality, an attractor point, of which yep. we will approach and we will discover it together. And you, of course, have a sense that it's closer to your own vision. And this is actually then different. is deep democracy and it's deliberative democracy, which is quite different from party democracy, which is a balance of power. So you have the workers' party, and then you have the bourgeois party, and then mm -hmm. the workers are 50%, and the bourgeois are 30%, and then you have some other interest groups, and then they fight it out, and then they make a compromise. And then sometimes one or the other gets a rhetorical advantage or whatever. But you're not supposed to reach a synthesis. The whole democratic system and party politics is based on these divisions. Yeah. The metamodernist or the integralist says, hey, I'm going to include you, 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 and you, and I'm already going to make the whole calculation beforehand through a process and understand how I'm going to include all of you. So I'm going to impose my higher dialectically predetermined, as it were, will upon sure. all, and I'm going to work transpartially and in a sense manipulate all of you to take this higher ground together. How's that playing out for you? That's fascinating to me. I'm doing that on a community level, but you've actually started engaging politically with that. What happened was well, a couple of things early on. One thing uh -huh. was some cult-like dynamics showed up around this stuff because people felt like there's this endogenous, more occult kind of knowledge around this that some people can grasp and others can't, and that some people see these attractor points clearer because it's so process-oriented. People get very orientated towards managing the relationships of one another. So you get an overemphasis on not the thing itself that you're supposed to be doing, but on the relationships. And in the relationship along, everybody's calling everybody else, talking about everybody else. Mm. So there's a dynamic that you start on an early level, even and when these things are relatively simple, they, they turn cultish in the, in the sense that it turns inwards and people become overly obsessed with the relationships of one another. Then I noticed that. And when I noticed that, this is my maybe five or six years ago, I started having nightmares that I was putting on a black mask and ordering people about to march like in some kind of fascist thing. And on the conscious level, there was nothing that would be <laughs> reminiscent of anything that had to authoritarian or fascist in these soft, soft, super, super democratic circles. Sure. And, and aha, the transpartisan thing, the one deeper will that controls the many, the one ring that rule them all. I saw a scary connection between holism and totalitarianism. I had been asking my integralist friends, oh, we see the, the orange shadow, we see the green shadow. Well, what's, what's, the, what's the integral shadow? And they said, well, there's something about being eager and wanting everybody else to be like you. But no, 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 no. I spotted it after a while. The shadow of integral and the shadow of metamodernism is fascism. It's uh, totalitarianism, which explains this wormhole that goes through this movement, down to cults, down to magic, then goes through magical beliefs, through UFOs, and in lances and fascists. And I hear the exact same people I hear saying, fuck you, faggots online, etc., and writing about how much they hate women and foreigners and all of that stuff. And the most authoritarian, most pro-violent ones who are still intelligent people in the integral community, I hear them talking about, oh, they're not just integral, they're actually core. They're like third tier. And when you're early, when you're yellow, and then you, you kind of don't yet integrate these lower stages, and then when you become um, coral, then you understand the value of, of being a fascist, basically. <laughs> How do we counteract these tendencies individually and collectively? Yeah, individually and collectively. Individually, it all really goes back to inner work and so forth. But I'm uh -huh. equally, I believe that people become fascist because we're angry at the world. We have mm. to individually go through a process of salvation and forgive the world for all the ways we were hurt. And, and that's beautiful, man. In many, many ways. Thanks, mm -hmm. buddy. I mean, I'm working really, really, really hard on this myself and uh, yeah. uh, have many wounds inside also. Uh, mm -hmm. But for instance, then, I mean, take it as a serious part-time job. It's not like 
oh, I did a little bit of this. Like, no, no, no. I mean, it takes money, it takes effort, it takes time, and it often takes relatively advanced contemplative techniques. So right now, doing aesthetics and beauty meditations uh, every morning after the run, etc., to try to revamp my brain to the higher states. So I'm not angry with the world, and I won't be acting out of bitterness. Aesthetic meditation, just briefly, is it? <sighs> well, so, so I'll grab an object, like some of my girlfriend's jewelry, and mm-hmm. I'll sit outside, maybe, if it's beautiful weather, and I'll let the sun shine on it, and I look for the for the quality of perfection. And after a while, when the quality of perfection is there, the quality of delight arises. And I sit there for a while. After a moment of delight, mm. a quality of wonder comes up because you notice there's delight all over here and there and there. And then if the quality of wonder manifests, then a euphoric happiness shows up. It can be subtle or it can be strong. And the euphoric happiness comes kind of from within or a source from above. It's difficult to say exactly where in one's phenomenology comes from, which kind of washes mm-hmm. over you. And there mm-hmm. is a, like the salvation or forgiveness. I have a brain meter. What happens on the brain meter is that the gamma waves, they jump up. They're usually down there and then they they dominate and the whole thing is turned upside down. Like the, so, so the fastest waves, waves associated with euphoric <laughs> love. I love that there's still some technological advancement included in your deep mystic aesthetic <laughs> practice there. <laughs> From the euphoric happiness position there, mm. And only there can you realistically get the equanimity that you need. So that that's yeah, where it's called to be able to battle that shadow we're talking about. Exactly. And and then from the equanimity, you can get to the safety position that something relaxes within you. And I'm not there. Yet. I'm working. Neither on. am I. That speaks to yeah. right my fault line as well. I think the fascist thing is because we're not getting into the safety zone. I mean, we don't feel like safe. Yeah. You yeah. know, on the first page of listening society, there's this thing: struggle reborn as play. Once play, yeah. safety, you get this sense of innocence, a kind of sense of directness that you're kind you're in a play world and that the world is vast and open it's a playground kind of like early childhood stuff i would say and i feel like that a lot i feel like you feel like that, that a lot that, yeah. that makes david feel speak, speak, speak to that a little bit the, the, the yeah, nature really, of shadow and integral and that whole area just finishing this one uh, and from there on when you're in that the immediacy hits you so that's where the power of now thing the Eckhart Tolle thing hits home yeah. and that's that's a very powerful meditation for me it only works if i if i go out for a run first <laughs> mm. or otherwise i'm just not in the zone enough sorry david you're gonna say no that's fine i've thought a lot about my own shadow around this totalitarian thing you know like mm. somewhere in me there is king david who knows how to do it all right and mm. i would love to just like be in charge and be like all right all you religious people to re-education camps you know like <laughs> there is <laughs> that the in, Chinese in me but yeah, <laughs> yeah i mean this is why in the way that i'm setting things up like i'm not in charge i I am interested in advocating for this system that I have to be submitted to just like everyone else. You know what I mean? It is a top down, like, yes, this is how we're going to do things, you know, but people decide to join it at least at first. And I also want to say, I think that there is a benefit to thinking for a while, like, what if I was King David? Like, what would I do? You know, because then you can start to think about like, well, like, how would you idealistically change things if you could just do whatever you wanted, you know, and then you can work backwards from there a little bit and you can be like, okay, well, that's obviously not going to happen. So like, what's a realistic way that we could maybe start to work in some of these directions? Like on the other side of this, let's send everyone to re-education camps. Maybe there's something more realistic, like we need to educate women. If we can get more educated women, you're going to have these women having less children because they're going to be more interested in working on the things that they want to do in their life. That's like a pretty good statistical correlation around Mm -hmm. stuff like that. So that's something that you can advocate for and people don't freak out about. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think it's a good thought experiment to think about what you would do if you could just do whatever you wanted. But yeah, I think you got to come back from that and think about the practical solutions as well. And is there a personal practice for your own shadow of totalitarianism that you've found or working on? Yeah, I mean, like kind of uh, relating to what Daniel was saying is that I like this idea of forgiving everyone. Like if I realize that I am the universe in flux, you know, that Mm -hmm. I'm just a manifestation of the universe, so is everyone else. Like we're all the same thing. Like I am you. So, and you are, you know, so it's like if I was you, which I am, I would be you, which I am. So how can I be mad at you for anything that you do? Because if I was you, which I am, I would do exactly what you're doing, which I am. (laughs) And so so it's like, you can kind of on this view, forgive everyone for everything. It's like, that's, yeah, I guess that's what I would do if I was this person in this circumstance. And I don't think everyone has a great life that's worth necessarily being grateful for, but I do. And even though I struggle, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be a part of this whole drama and to get to live out this stuff. And if I can help, I feel great about that. Like when I feel like this stuff is helping people, yeah, 
that just makes me feel like my life matters. I'd like to add something on the collective thing. Thank you, David. It actually, it feels reassuring to hear you talk about the forgiveness aspect, etc. on a very profound level, not just forgive this person for doing that, but forgive the world for being a bitch sometimes, right? Because I mean, the underlying sense of all of these going sour things appears to be some kind of revenge or bitterness, etc. Some kind of what is actually a healthy life affirming impulse, but it gets on the defensive. And I can certainly see that in myself as well. I don't know if you follow Hansi's Facebook page, people will post the craziest things. And okay, so people are being defensive, etc. I was going to say on an interpersonal collective level and in select groups or, or larger, I would like to say on the more interpersonal level, I think there's something very important that has to do with the will to power that you mentioned, David, and that the will to power is natural, that all parts of the big weave of life long for fuller expression, long to express what's on the inside, outside in the world. Somehow, even if you're an insect, you want to interact with the world in a way that's favorable to you, according to those premises. And so if we forgive the world and forgive it fully, we should also forgive this impulse to will to power in all points, in yeah. fact, points of the, the cosmos. So it means that we should give up, in, in one sense at least, give up the, the new age idea that you can exercise the egos of other people. And if they were only to give up their egos and they wouldn't be so selfish and just want power for themselves, then everything would be fine because then everything would fall in its natural place, which just happens to be the thing that I want. <laughs> and everything in its natural place would just be the, world, the way I want. So when we build this deep alliances around on core networks of people, we should make it known to ourselves and transparent, like the three layers of our motivations. So the first motivation is the higher transcendental one, and they're real. They're real. Man. People are prepared to die for these things. So, so somebody really, really, really wants the animals not to suffer in, in, in all of these cruel animal factories and so forth. And another person really, really, really wants gender equality, whatever it might be. And then the second part is like the ego part, like, okay, what do I get out of this? And that's the natural part. So maybe I want to end yeah. animal slavery. And then also, I want to feel like a hero when I do it. No. Absolutely. Okay. I know that I want there to be statues of me in the future in this good society. You know <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and the thing is, it, and it, if I want to and all that. If I want to remove that part of you, I also remove a very important part of, you know, what drives you and who you are and how this all fits together. So I can't love you words and all. And then we get to the scary part. Both of these things, the transcendental and the ego level connect to like a basement level, which is some kind of crack or lack or some something we're trying to cover, some kind of impossibility, some kind of paradox that haunts us, some shameful vision of ourselves that maybe we got stuck into for many years or in many different situations. Yeah. And, and we don't want to be that thing or... Or maybe, you know, we were abused or maybe something else, you know, for some reason, we want to cover up something. And even that part needs to be accepted and loved, like the wound. And that's the dark part. That's where we can get really dark. But if we shine light on all of these things and in the right settings, in the closely therapeutically knit communities, we can love each other and not blame each other for our limitations. Yeah. So on, on that point, I think that's a beautiful split. What I'm interested in then, and the work that I'm up to, is working fundamentally on that last area that you speak about. Mm -hmm. Because I think one of the criticisms I'd lay at the feet of integralism and maybe what's happening in metamodern circles, I'm not sure. When you arrive through the intellectual door, people, they're not wanting to go down into the basement very quickly because they're immediately going to lose their status if they show their feathers that way. Exactly. So I, I'm feeling to start with that together and go up from there. But that's a very personal, deeper... Yeah. That would be the impulse of many, many fellow metamodernists and, and integralists that they say, okay, let's... Let's, let's work through the shadow. Let's let's go collective healing, etc. Mm -hmm. But it never works for the reason that if mm -hmm. our purposes aren't yet aligned, then we won't be able to stretch our minds and loyalties and hearts far enough to be able mm -hmm. to really like what we see. We just see that what's here and now. I, I push back on this point. In this very room that I'm sitting in for the last year, I've been doing a deep process with 10 people going into this very issue without having had a shared philosophy beforehand. Mm -hmm. And there have been some very deep cracks that came up. Seeing sides of a person that I loved very dearly in all its glory, and I was stretched to the point of, do I still love this person now that I've seen deep into the chasm? And there was a few moments there where, to be honest, I didn't. And that scared the shit out of me because that, that pulled apart my whole philosophy of change. Okay. And yet with enough time with that person, I've rediscovered that love. And because of that bond we have together, delving into the theories now is that much more enjoyable and there's that much more trust. So, Okay, Joe, a, I don't mean this as a universal rule. I mean it as a rule. Yeah. And yeah, I think you said a key thing there. You said mm -hmm. with enough time. So yes. I mean, a weekend workshop, no fucking way you know no like way. in, in no a way. larger network of people working to position themselves and get grants etc and and uh, you know vying for the same audiences no fucking way man right on a larger level you got him have you ever seen that video where the guy talks about how like great 
leaders move from the why, like they move from the why outwards. Like I I'm think that, like, yeah, the yeah, like, out. yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like from why to what to how. I think you're right. I think that you really start to bring people together underneath that why. Like it's that kind of banner of purpose that allows for people to come together and unite. Right. Uh, but I mean, it should be honored that the thing Joe is doing is possible yeah. under good circumstances. Yeah, under the right and more on a person instance, to person kind of level too, right? Yeah, if you have the right people and the right amount of time and and your leadership and it's relatively over a long period and under skillful leadership, then you can do it. That is there any other be- way to always change though? Because this this is just naturally where I gravitate because of my background. I work with people. I find it difficult to see how I could take a room filled with amazing European intellectuals. I, I don't want to, I haven't been there, so I haven't seen it. And then go into that work because it would feel like, I feel like it's just like a natural starting point that we need uh-huh. to commit people uh-huh. to be in process, in community, in collectives and start there and build up. I can't see any other way forward, but I'd love to hear if you if you can. Mm. No, I, I agree. Maybe I wouldn't use the words community collect. I would use more of the words networks. The main capital then of this formation, or I mean the main fuel, it would be trust. Yes, and trust and networks it, is the perfect name that I have for it. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> and then, you, you know, trust on these three levels then, uh, that aha, yes. your transcendental purpose is not directly against mine. So, yes. and I mean, when people call me up from fascism.com and uh, want to talk about the future metamodernism, I, I, I'm, I'm going to crash on the transcendental purpose. Even even if I respect yeah. you. Know. Just on the transcendental purpose, I found a fascinating thing. Look, I, I've got to admit, I came from more of the idealist perspective. Wilbur uh-huh. really got me with his ideas and I've been absorbing the heart of the world and I've, I've gone beyond the transrational to actually believing some of that stuff until David's kind of spun me back out of that over the last few months, which I'm hugely grateful for. And I've, I've, I've gone between both worlds and I'm in a community. And so over the last few months, I've literally shifted ontology massively. I've gone through existential nihilism for a few days there and infected my Thai girlfriend with it, the poor thing as well, and, and come back out again. But what I've discovered is if you look at it with the mythopoetic interpretation, there isn't a conflict between most of the time the characters that you'll find in an integral setting. There isn't a point that it clashes so much that we can't still walk on that same shadow work political movement, which I've been really happy to find, that the transcendental, the, the oneness of materialism and the oneness of all is love, they kind of resonate. You just need to know how to interpret. Daniel, in your own existential, you, you alluded to a period of time where you've, you've, mm. you've gone into it. And I wonder whether now you feel equipped and are you working in smaller groups with some of the people around you in metamodernism mm. on those kind of contexts, on that kind of sharing? Yeah, yeah. So yes, I am. I put this more on long-term life planning because it's very easy to, well, especially when you're young, to f- kind of feel like, oh, I'm just going to fix this, and then I'm, you know, it'll be open fields or something. Then it's yeah. all clear. Uh, yeah, then it's all clear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> going clear. I rather think of it this way: that I'm 36 now, and I have a goal that in four years, when I turn 40, I will have worked through and done my homework on a bunch of central issues that will put me in a healthier and strong mode from which I can work on cumulatively from that point on. That's not an abstract goal, though. It's something I put hours into every day these days. So there's, so a, more there's, a, scary, there's a scary dynamic which emerges around this of no matter how much we try and create uh, perfect networks and mm-hmm. we, we try and take the central man out of it. What I've seen again and again, my father has been leader of organizations. I've seen this happen. He's explained it to me. You watch it anywhere. When you put a leader or you have a certain theorist, for better or worse, their positivities, their idiosyncrasies and their shadows permeate through the whole system and the people that were around. So I think there is a real onus on the people that are putting the step forward, you know, even though leading from behind in a non-fascist way as possible, we've got to be aware of our shadows because they go a lot further than just doing small process work. So I think it's really critical. And I think it's how we avoid the mistakes of some of these leaders that we've seen come before. I mean, these are great men that have fallen again and again. And uh, I've been enjoying yeah. the quote, absolute power doesn't corrupt absolutely. Absolutely. It reveals absolutely. And yeah, I'm curious and I want to get a dialogue going on that kind of process work in small groups that we can kind of, you know, open that up, open source as to, as to what the groups are doing. We've all been doing these experiments. The 60s was an interesting time for that. You looked at like some of these like depth psychology weekends, what they were getting into, process weekends, and they touched on something, but it seems they didn't integrate it into a package we can just pick up. It's kind of all over the place, I find. Yeah, I'm really interested in trying to make sure that I don't want to be the leader. I want to be a leader and I want to invite a bunch of other people to be the leader too, you know? Like, uh, and Daniel, this is a great time for me to tell you that if ever you have something that you just put out or what you want to advertise for, like consider my group, your group too. Because I've told this to other integral leaders who are doing stuff. I want it to be a bunch of different leaders, a bunch of people putting out content. And so 
I definitely feel like, you know, you and I are on the same page. So consider my group, your group. If you want to go live and talk to people, if you have stuff you want to put out, like I'm very, very happy to share my space with you. And I really appreciate all the work that you're doing. And I also want to thank you for the extra time that you've put in, in this talk today. I really appreciate the opportunity to hang And we out talked for a long time, right? Normally I would have run out of energy a long time ago. So apparently I've been energized. Energized. So we've reached an interesting point in the discussion here where we move from like dancing around the theoretical edges to begin with. We're moving into that listening empathic stage, which speaks uh -huh. to a really beautiful tension within all the movements that we have that we're going to hurry up because these threats are on our door. But once you start peeling off the layers and listening to people, you realize that actually you need to slow down that this is such a slow and long process that we've got to take time. If we try and rush whatever we're up to, then we just put more stress and anxiety in the system and we inflame some of these dynamics that we see earlier on. So exactly. yeah, it's the dynamic, the, the paradox at the heart of it. Yeah. So it's really an invitation for us to continue online, offline, listening to each other's stories, seeing each other's perspectives and healing and growing and transforming together. Mm. Well, well said, man. Perhaps that's well, a nice place for us to end this discussion today. Yeah, and, um, I think so. We pick up the thread again in, in a few months. I'd like to check in again and, and also see how the progress of the movement's going on. Because I think the fires are just starting to burn over there in Europe. You've, you've got a really good head start on this there, Daniel, of what you've been doing. And it's, I'm, I'm keen to learn from, from the things that emerge. Likewise. Yeah, I feel there's an unlikely high level of convergence here. So we should, each of us, try to feel into it and think about it long-term a bit more, sleep on it, and see if, it, like, okay, can we do anything with this crystallization? And if not, that's okay. It's just that I, I do sense there is something interesting going on in this direction, just, just the three of us. Yeah. And Okay, wonderful. So glad to get to know both of you. Yeah, what a pleasure. Yeah. And, and so Thailand is this wonderful central location between Europe and the US. Mm -hmm. It's tropical year round. There's beautiful people here. The fruits are cheap. It's good to go running. There's many beautiful things upon which to meditate and wonder. There's a node building here in Asia. And I invite anyone who's listening to this to come and visit, to plug into it. We're a worldwide network of change makers. And yeah, let's connect up in person mm -hmm. as well as online. And then you told me before, it was, it's relatively easy to get by. I mean, with the not cheap. so high funds. Uh, so For all you philosopher artists out there, struggling to make ends meet while you work on your magnum opus, this is the place to do it. Massage costs less than $8 an hour. That's awesome. <laughs> that is yeah. pretty nice. I it's mean, pretty our cool. plates are pretty full, but you know, I'm sure we could figure out a time and a place at some point to get out there. It seems like a pretty legit happening. But man, I really want to thank you, Joe, for putting this together and for doing the work to make this happen. I have super enjoyed this. And you know, Daniel, thanks for agreeing and for spending your time. And we've talked before. It was great to have that private talk, but I really enjoyed being able to talk to you about this stuff in public and I really do look forward to figuring out how we can work together in the future. I'm sure we have a lot that we can potentially do together. So, mm. so thank you, uh, both of you. And uh, yeah, uh, good thing that you put it together, Joe. Yeah, much love yeah. to both of you guys. We'll be in touch and see what evolves out of this space. Thanks so much for watching. Big up to Joe and Daniel for this talk. And thanks to my Patreons for all their support. Consider supporting me on Patreon. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Join the I Am David Long Friends and Fans Facebook group. Buy the merch, all the things. Thanks so much. Peace.